Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Welcome to our next addition to our studying together, Gates of Trust, Shar HaBitachon. And of course, before we start, we always like to give tzedakah. So find a coin. Um, and we'll start off with giving tzedakah. Gedel tzedakah, shemikareves es ha Everyone put into your tzedakah box. And we will start with Tehillim. Good morning, Rosalie. Good morning, Francesca. Good morning, Clara. Um, you can all put down if you would like anyone to have a mind when we say Tehillim. Please put their names down. I would like to mention that today's Sheor will be Le'il Onishmas, a young woman who passed away from COVID two days ago. Menucha Bas Emmanuel. And we just, our heart goes out to her family, to her dear Aunt Elaine, and to her children. And we hope to see the end of Gullus very soon. And also in honor of Lorette Rosen's mom, I do not know her name, but I want to have her in mind as well as we learn today. Okay, our Tehillim today will be said in schus of a complete refuah shalema. And again, put down any names if you want us to say Tehillim for them. Yaakov Moshe ben Necha, Yehudas bas Sara, Yitzchak Moshe ben Rachel Reza, Tzipora Hinda bas Rachel Miriam, Sara bas Chana, Yerachmiel ben Moshe Rachmiel ben Miriam Rush, Mushka, Tinok ben Shifra Rezal, Tzipora Hinda bas I said that was Rachel Miriam, Hannah Devara, Bas Golda Bastia. Okay, and I think we have good morning, Barb, good morning, Inez, good morning, Brenda. Rosalie has Mordechai Shimon, Ben Razel, and Hilly Bas Liba. Okay, good morning, Ali and Gitla, Bas Sims. Maybe Simcha? I don't know, you want to put that down? Okay, Amram ben Mazel. Good morning, Pauline. Sima. Okay, that's what I thought. So it's great to see all of you. I'm super excited for two reasons. Number one, my daughter Basi gave birth to a little baby girl at 6 a.m. this morning. So I'm now, Baruch Hashem, a grandmother of another beautiful, healthy grandchild. And I don't just take this lightly. I am exuberant, ecstatic, thrilled, besimcha, and grateful to Hashem for another beautiful, healthy granddaughter, another beautiful, healthy grandchild. This is so, this is so for us. We never take anything for granted. Never ever take any child, grandchild for granted. Every baby born is like the greatest miracle in the world. Yes, Basi's <laughs> baby. Um, so thank you, Hashem. Hodel Hashem Kitov. And I feel like what's a better way to celebrate the birth of a granddaughter by studying Torah together. And we will start now. Um, also having in mind, having in mind all of those that are still missing or who passed away in Surfside, our heart and our mind and our prayers are with them. And really, really, you know, Shar Batachan is really all about trust. And it's, it's hard. You know, it's hard to talk about trust when you know so many families are subrochen. But we don't waver. A Jew never gives up. Actually, after this class, you might want to Google an incredible song by Benny Freeman. It's called A Yid Never Gives Up His Trust, something like that. And it's, if I could sing right now, I would. But it's all about that a Yid never gives up, no matter what is happening to us. We know that giving up isn't an option because putting your trust in what? In the firemen, 
in the emergency crews, in engineers, we can't. And um, it's very trying times now, very trying times. But good morning. Good morning, Denise. Denise, in case you missed it, Basi gave birth to a baby girl. I know, Elaine is finding it very hard. Yeah, yeah, losing a niece at a young age is not easy. And none of us can even give explanation or rationales. We could just be with you, Elaine, hold your hand and say, it is so hard. And only Hashem knows what that could mean and what the purpose is. And we don't know, we don't know. And we have to be humble enough to say we don't know. And that's why I love this book. I love the Sefer, Shar B'Tachon, written by Rabbeinu Bachya Ben Pekuda, Ibn Pekuda. It's a series from Chovas of Lubavos. And for those of you that are new to this class, this is the Felig edition to this book that was just reprinted by Kahus. And it is called The Gate of Trust, and it is so powerful. It will instill you with so much trust in God when we are so shaken and so lost, worried, apprehensive, but we don't ever give up in our trust in Hashem. So last two weeks, we spoke about the benefits of trusting in Hashem. And I'm not going to review what I what I learned we learned in the past. If you're new to the class, feel free to go on Facebook Live, look for Goldie Plotka, and you'll find the other classes. We spoke about tranquility, and this week we are going to focus on two points. One is misguided trust, and if we can, we will get to the next part, which is independence, which is actually I love that section. I hope we'll get you there. Okay, let's get started. Are you ready to start? Give me a thumbs up, my friends, who I can't see you, but I know you're here. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to get to the next part of Gates of Trust. And this one is Misguided Trust. And so Rabbi Bechaya Pekuda will tell us that until now the author has been explaining in general terms that when a person relies on anything other than Hashem, he is doomed to fail. Now the author brings us specific examples of things that people tend to place their trust in and how they do not really provide security. So he starts off by saying, if he relies on his own wisdom, his own schemes, his own physical strength and his own efforts, these efforts will be for naught. He will become weak and lose the physical strength. His schemes and wisdom will fall short of accomplishing his goals. And as the verse says, he traps clever people in their shrewdness. So what does this mean? So basically, the author is saying that this verse about he traps which jo Yoav tells us he traps clever people in his shrewdness. What, what is he trying to teach us here? He's saying that man should not rely on his plans, no matter how shrewd or brilliant his plans is. You ever, you've heard this expression, give me a thumbs up, a man tracht und Gott lacht, right? Most of you have heard that expression, either from your parents or from people who speak Yiddish. A man plans, but God has other plans, right? A man tracht, when a Kaddish Baruch Hu lacht. What does that mean? It means that we have to realize that we have to make plans, but we don't have to put our trust only in our plans, in our shrewdness, in our brilliance. We go and start a business and it's all about my experience, my connections, my prowess, my personality. I'm going to do it because I'm so smart. You know, I have to tell you, there's a book that was written recently by a, a woman who is one of the big movers and shakers in TikTok. All right. Have you ever heard of TikTok? You do a little dance on TikTok, 
right? Teens and young people in it and anybody who wants to get enough likes, they post on TikTok. If you've heard of TikTok, let me know. Well, one of the big CEOs or one of the producers or uh, the big, as I said, the, boo the big makers and shakers of TikTok is a Jewish woman by the name of Michal Oshman. And I spoke to Michal yesterday. She is, lives in England. She's now in Israel visiting her parents. And she wrote a book called, What Would You Do If You Were Not Afraid? And I was gonna go out and buy a book today. She told me her, her uh, publisher is gonna send me a copy. What is the book about? So I say to her, Michal, what's this book about? She goes, you know, Goldie, I am very up there in the world of technology, in the world of PR, and I am really one of the high sought after people in the world of TikTok today, which has millions and millions of viewers. She goes, but I was feeling empty. I was lost. I was afraid. Everybody in my industry was looking up to Michal. What does Michal say? What does Michal know? What is Michal doing? What is Michal thinking? Everybody wanted to know. But inside, I was broken. I was lost. I was depleted. I looked for medicine. I looked for doctors. I looked for meditation. I looked in other fields of religion. I searched everywhere. And then she tells me, I found it. I found it in Torah. Specifically, I found it in Hasidus, which is what we're learning here. When we learn Tanya, we learn Hasidus, right? I learned it and I wrote this book. What would you do if you were not afraid? And I wrote this book with chapters. And each chapter delves with believing in Hashem and how it changes your entire perspective in life, in business, in relationships, in, in your parenting, in everything. And she has a chapter in this book that deals with fear. But if you have God in your life, it will eradicate. And she is, sounds like the most amazing, eloquent young woman. She's a young mom, really up there, but still struggling like everyone else in the world with fear, with the unknown, with confusion. Everyone. There isn't a woman who's watching here today that doesn't go through that. You know, sometimes your, your heart begins to pulsate or begins to pound and you're not sure what it is. It could be you have a doctor appointment. It could be you're waiting for a report. It could be your child is going into labor. It could be you're waiting for an interview. It could be anything. There's so much unknown. And this woman wrote this book. And I would say that studying what we are today is going to give us... Oh, so I want to tell you, so Michal is going to be speaking to our community exclusively in October, Metashem, stay tuned for the date and time. And uh, if you want to sign up to listen to Michal's talk and the interview I'm going to be having with her, you'll buy the book. So you don't have to pay for um, watching, but you need to purchase the book. And information will be coming soon. So don't buy the book and Indigo yet. You'll buy the book through the show. And then you can uh, have a, an exclusive viewing of Michal on our show website. So I'm super excited. So getting back to the misguided trust, Michal felt that this is what she was lacking. And what is the, 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 the book telling us? This book, Shara Bitachon, what is it telling us? It says that if you put your trust in others, you will never feel secure. Why? Because when you put your tr rely on your abundance of wealth or you put your reliance in your strength or in your wisdom, God forbid these things can go, come and go, right? Because these are all very transitory s s states. You could have your money today, gone tomorrow. But Ibn Chayy tells us something very interesting. We know a lot of people that have wealth. 
So what do you mean it's gone tomorrow? I know people that have wealth for 60, 80 years. So what he's saying is so brilliant. And listen to me. He's saying, you might have the wealth, but if we don't trust and thank Hashem for the wealth, the money can go for other things. So a story that I just recently heard was, was this person who started be becoming Shomer Shabbat, but they felt like they had to work on Shabbos. They had to work on Shabbos. They needed the extra money. They worked five days a week, but for some reason they had a lot of clients and her clients needed her for Shabbat. And she felt that if she didn't work on Shabbos, she's going to be missing out on thousands of dollars a year. So as much as she really put her trust in God, she felt like she had to put her trust in her clients. And so she went to work. And then suddenly she found that her car broke down and she had to redo the, the motor and the engine and thousands of dollars. And she goes, well, isn't it good that I have this job on Shabbat? Now I could pay my bills. But Shara Batochan is saying, my dear woman, if you wouldn't have gone to work on Shabbos, your car would not have been broken. You would not have had to put your money into fixing your car. So the expenses that we sometimes have, a broken fridge, a broken this, a broken that, if we put our trust in Hashem, we have less things to fix. We're talking about even doctor's bills or medications. When we put our implicit trust in Hashem, He saves us from these bills because He's guarding our wealth. Does this make sense to you? Does this resonate with you? And if it doesn't, feel free to put it in the comments. Let's make this more interactive. If you have a conflict with what I'm saying right now, put it into the, into the, into the, right now onto the comments and, and let's discuss this. And he goes on, he says, utilize your abilities and strength because it's given, because it is God given vehicle. Don't use your strength and your business prowess because you are born with this brilliant mind. Who gave you the brilliant mind? Recognize your source. That's all we're saying here. He's saying recognize the source of your wealth. Recognize the source of your strength. Recognize the source of your wisdom. There's an interesting pasuk that I keep in mind all the time. And it's like this. There are people that walk around saying, my strength and my wisdom gives me this success. It's my koach, my might that gives me all this success. And Hashem says, no, my child. This is all coming from God. But like we said last week, but if you want to put your trust elsewhere, then that's where your hashgacha will come. And then you got to leave it up to that. Leave it up to your own strength. Leave it up to your own wisdom because you're taking your hashgacha away from Hashem. And this could be very, very scary. Yirmiyahu, and I, I might have quoted last week, Yirmiyahu, which is Jeremiah, he quotes this pasuk. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the spring of living waters, to dig for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that do not hold water. And I'm going to share with you a story about this man, this father-in-law. He's got this new son-in-law who was living off the fat of the earth. Basically, he was living off his father-in-law's wealth. And he had enough. And he says to his son-in-law, listen, listen, Mo Moses, you got to go out there and make your own living. And so someone goes, well, you know, I don't even know where to start. He goes, okay, I'm going to give you a chunk of money. Go to town and pick up something that's worthwhile, that you will be able to resell and make a profit. So the son goes to town, looks around at the fear, what's going on, notices a man selling toothpicks. He thinks, whoa. That's a whole lot of toothpicks for this amount of money. He goes over and he goes, I want those toothpicks. And he gives him all the money his father-in-law gave him. 
fills up his wagon full of toothpicks. He feels my father-in-law is going to be absolutely impressed with my business acumen. I mean, look, I gave him money, but look what I got. An entire wagon full of toothpicks. What a genius. What a chacham. Okay. Comes driving into town with this wagon. The father-in-law looks at him and goes, what? What in the world did you buy? He goes, my father-in-law, look, look, you gave me a limited amount of money, but I have unlimited toothpicks. He goes, you dumb cup. Your toothpicks are going to be around for a million years. I mean, how many toothpicks does one family have to buy? It's going to take you a hundred years to sell this wagon. Oh, you're such a klutz. He gives him money one more time. He goes, listen, my buddy, go buy something that people need, that people really need. So the son-in-law goes back into the town and he looks around. What can I do to impress my father-in-law? What's a good schaira? What's a good quality? Sees a man selling shofars. You know the shofars we blow on Rosh Hashanah? He thinks to himself, hey, this is good. Everybody needs to hear the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. I'm going to buy a wagon of shofrot. Pays the man the money. Comes back with a wagon of shofrot. And this time, he's really, really impressed with himself. Because he knows, listen, everybody needs to hear the shofar. His father-in-law hears the wagon coming into town and he says to his son-in-law, Maze? What's this? He goes, wait, wait, father let me explain. Give me a minute. This is an incredible wagon full of chauffeurs. You know Rosh Hashanah is coming in a month? Everyone has to hear the chauffeur. Everyone's going to buy these chauffeurs. The father-in-law looks at him. He says, you're a bigger dumb than I thought. What kind of guy did my... S <coughs> what kind of guy did my s daughter marry? You're a bigger klutz than I thought. Every city <coughs> needs maybe one or two shoifers. <coughs> the rabbi re blows the shofar for the entire synagogue. A thousand people share one shoifer. What do you think, every... Family, do you all have a shoifer? Let me ask you, each one of you has a shoifer? No. You go to shul, you go to synagogue, and the rabbi blows the shoifer for you. He looks at his son and goes, you are such a nutcase. What was I thinking? And he's really upset because he wasted so much money. Now sitting in his backyard is a wagon full of toothpicks and another wagon full of shoifers. So he thinks to himself, you know what? I have some friends who are wheeler dealers. I am going to ask them to come and sell these two wagons for me. And so he calls his two friends in, Joey and Mikey. And he says to them, I have two wagons. And you guys are smart businessmen. I want you to go into the fair and sell these two wagons full of merchandise for something valuable. And they look and they go, one guy goes, toothpicks? Another guy, shoifers? They go, listen, I know really, really very simplistic, non-essential items, but do me a favor. Go and just trade it in for anything, just anything. And so the two guys go out to town. They come back a few hours later. And the father-in-law looks and he starts to laugh. Joey, who went out with the toothpicks, is schlepping back a wagon full of shoifers. And Mikey, who went in with the shoifers, is coming back with a wagon of toothpicks. And he can't stop laughing, cracking himself up with this hilarious situation. Now the son-in-law is sitting there and the son-in-law says, my dear father-in-law, when I came back with the toothpicks and I came back with the shoifers, you weren't laughing. You were furiated. You were fuming at me. The father-in-law says, come here. He goes over to Joey and he goes, Joey, I don't understand. 
I gave you the shavers. Why'd you come back with toothpicks? Hey, Mikey, I gave you the toothpicks. Why'd you come back with the shavers? He goes, look, we went to town. You told us to find something that we could barter. And this is what we found. So the father turns to his son and he goes, what don't you understand? I gave these two guys junk. They came back with junk. But I gave you real cash. I gave you real money. And you came back with junk. That's why with them I'm laughing. But with you, I'm angry. That's similar to what Hashem is telling us here in this Pasuk of Jeremiah. He says, I'm giving you, he says to the children of Israel, I am giving you a beautiful cistern of water. I'm giving you an abundance of opportunity to trust in me. I am the creator of the universe. I am in control of it all. Your health, your wealth, your wisdom, everything. And what are you doing? You're exchanging my well of water for a broken cistern. That's what's bothering Hashem. Yes, we have friends that are smart out there. We've got friends that have brilliant business acumen. We have friends who are high up there in banking, in finance, in, in real estate. And we feel like if we only got a job with them and we put our trust in them, we have our life set out. We will be a success. But Hashem is saying, that's a broken cistern. Don't put your, you know, and I'll give you another example. You know, today people complain that in order to get through to the CEO or the boss, you got to call the secretary. And the joke is, if you want to get through to anyone, you got to become friends with the secretary. Have you ever heard that f comment before? If you really want to get into this business, become friends with the secretary. She, the, the, the boss listens to her. Now imagine how ridiculous it is if you want to thank the boss for giving you an opportunity. Instead, you thank the secretary. You buy her a big bouquet of flowers because you say to yourself, I really got to get on the good side of the secretary. She's the one that's the mover and shaker. Is that true? <laughs> a secretary? A mover and shaker? I mean, secretaries are amazing. They make our companies run. But secretaries aren't invested in the job. They can give you a resignation paper in three weeks and they're gone. If you really want to get your foot in the door, you got to get in your foot in the door with the CEO. That's what Hashem is saying. If you want to make yourself a success in this world, don't put your faith in any of the basar vidam, in human beings. Put your faith in the boss. Who's the boss? Tell me in the comments, who's the boss? Is it Governor Cuomo, the governor in New York, who made a bold statement a few weeks ago and says, the curve is now ending because of what we have done. I'm going to quote him directly. The chutzpah of a governor to get out there and say these words. He says, it's because of us, we changed the curve. I wish I could find the words that he actually quoted. We handled the curve. It's not God, it's us. We're the ones that made things change. How ridiculous it is. But I need to tell you something else, my friends. We still have to get out there and make a Kaylee. What's a Kaylee? Well, if you know what the word Kaylee means, give me a thumbs up. What's a Kaylee? We have to make a Kaylee. Yagia kapecha vitochal. You have to work Make a Kaylee and then you will eat. What do you mean we have to make a Kaylee? I trust in God. What's, that's good enough. I wake up in the morning, I'll pray a whole day. I'll sit and say, God, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. Now deliver me my, my income. Ah, so Beth and Dorit say, no, a Kaylee is a vessel. We must create the vessel. We got to work hard. But look at the word. Yagia kapecha vitochal. You have to use your hands. Kapecha. What do you think about that? God is saying like this. Use your hands. 
Invest your hands in your work. But don't put your entire being into your work. A little example about this fellow who used to sell galoshin. Anybody know what galoshin means? Galoshin. He used to sell galoshin. Galoshin are rubber boots. This was a big business in days in, in Soviet Russia at that time. And this fellow was very much into his galoshin. He made a big business and he was very successful. One day, Shabbat, he came to his rabbi, his rebbe for Shabbos, and his rebbe noticed that he's very, very consumed with his business. He's talking about it, he's discussing it, he's analyzing it with his friends, he's excited about it, he's pumping about it. So before Shabbos is over, he, you know, he calls his chassid in and he says to him, you know, Reb Pinchas, what do you do for a living? He says, hey, I'm a big producer of galoshin. I'm the biggest producer in Leningrad with galoshin. Nobody, nobody has the industry like I do. He says, wonderful, you're making a lot of money? He goes, yeah, are you funny? I have uh, employees, I have companies all over the city. I have the empire on Galoshin. He says, tell me, he says, when God tells us we have to yagia kapecha, we have to work hard with our hands to make a living because we have to make a vessel. But the word that God uses is kapecha. Use your hands. He goes, I've seen people stick their feet in Galoshin. I've never seen someone stick his head into Galoshin. Meaning, I've seen people stick their feet into their rubber boots, but I've never seen a person stick their head, their entire head into their rubber boots. You have stuck your entire head in your boots. Live it up to Hashem. Give it up to Hashem. Go to work. Use your hands, but don't immerse your entire mind, your entire heart into your life, into your business. Leave your mind and heart to Torah study, to doing good deeds, to charity, to putting your trust in others and, and putting your trust in Hashem. And that leads me to a buzzword that is very, 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 very um, spoken about today in 2020, 2021. There's a woman by the name of Mia, Pia Melody. She wrote a book about codependency. Have you ever heard of this book, anyone? She talks today about the idea that so many of us are codependents, that we put our trust in others and we actually almost sell our soul for others. The third part of gates of belief, gates of trust that we are learning, talks about not only tranquility and misguided trust, but he talks about independence independence which is the opposite of codependency and he says that one of the Torah advantages of Betachon is you will become independent wow give me a thumbs up if you would like to have a life of independence Carol, yes. I think the governor should have mentioned God when report, reporting the decline of the COVID. He very arrogantly said the curve was dependent on us. We, the government, had the absolute power and our absolute wisdom that changed the curve that the decline of COVID-19 was because of us. And alluding to what I referred to before, that pasuk, kolchi vi otsem yadi, asali es achayel It was my power, my wisdom, my prowess that got us to bring the decline. No mention of God, no mention of God. You have to say, with God's help, and with all our great abilities and influencers and help, we were able to slow the curve. 
But to walk around saying, it wasn't God. And you know, you could look it up. He said that. That is absolute arrogance and that's misplaced trust. But today I want, I know it's already 1020, so we're going to be, I'll just start off on this. The idea that when you have trust in Hashem, you actually gain your independence. So what do I mean? Okay, I'm going to write, say something sensitive. And you can agree or disagree. You can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. But how many of us are smitten by other people? Uh, maybe they have a hierarchy in, in, our, in our business. Or maybe someone in our family that's very, very, very wealthy, very, very um, competent. We want to gain favor in their eyes. So we're very f flattering. We give them incredible amount of flattery. A relative who you want them to give you maybe a big present, a big gift. Or you want someone to give you a big raise or um, maybe a new position in your business. And you flatter them and you're almost like consumed with your trust in them. And you do it almost ad nauseum. It's, and, and it bothers you. You know that you're being, you know, sometimes untruthful. Like you know you're not really saying the truth, but you want to gain their love or you want to gain something from them and you feel the need to flatter them so much so that you know it isn't truthful, but you need to do it so you can have a good standing in their eyes. And again, it could be a wealthy uncle. It could be a brilliant brother-in-law, uh, an incredible, you know, distant relative. And you know that if you constantly compliment them and you're at their constant whim because you want a foot into the door, and afterwards you feel, thank you, Carol. I love that word, a psychophant. You feel, did I say it correctly? You feel like you are so lowering yourself. Who are you? You don't look in the mirror and the next morning, you're like, what's with me? Why am I like overindulging them with praise when half of it isn't true? And, I, and I'm becoming this, this like self like a, a lower them because I feel like I have to praise them unconditionally. Otherwise I lose my, you know, or someone has this magnificent cottage and you want to come and you want to be there. And so you compliment them and they'll just invite me, invite me. Or I want, you know, look, this is, this is the nature of the world. Do you agree with me guys? Do you agree with me? I know Jermit says a hundred percent. Do you agree with me? And it's hard to actually agree. Because sometimes you have to look at yourself and you go, am I overdoing it? Am I putting so much codependency on someone else? Am I the independent person that I want to be? Or is it all about giving up for someone else? Till it's just someone I don't even recognize. When we trust in Hashem, you know that if that job is meant to be yours, you'll get it. Regardless of how small you have to make yourself. And if that house is going to be yours, you'll get it. No matter how much you have to over indulge or over compensate in some ways. If it's meant to be, it will be. You have to do your part. You have to make the vessel. But don't become someone that you don't recognize in the mirror eventually. We're going to talk about codependency a little bit more next week. I want to wish you all a great week. And I'm super excited to go visit my granddaughter in Pittsburgh. So I think my next class might be in Pittsburgh. See you all. Take care. That's right, Dorit says, if that job is not going to be yours, no matter what you say or do, it's not going to be yours. Excellent. Yes, I think this class is resonating with a lot of us. This is a very, very, very important class. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Elaine, stay strong. A week of blessings. A week of gesund. A week of nachas. A week of good news only. 
Thank you, Tova. Thank you, Ness. Thank you, all of you, for your good wishes and wishing you a great week.